My name is Avery Irons, and I'm the director of the training and technical assistance uh, side of the New York State Youth Justice Institute. Let me start by welcoming each of you to our Lunch and Learn webinar series. We appreciate that you are making time to learn more about youth justice research. Please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. I want to also express my thanks to our partners in New York State, the Division of Criminal Justice Services, the University at Albany, and the New York State Juvenile Justice Advisory Group. Without their support, we would not be here. It is my pleasure to be the first to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Marina Tulu Shams. Dr. Tulu Shams, thank you so much for joining us today. We're looking forward to your presentation. It's also my pleasure to hand off the baton to today's facilitator, Alicia May, and I'd be remiss if I did not introduce her uh, and mark the completion of her doctoral studies. Dr. May, we are very proud of you and the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Avery. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Youth Justice Institute's Lunch and Learn webinar series. As Avery said, my name is Alicia May and I am the YJI's Research and Evaluation Specialist. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Marina Tulu Shams. Dr. Tulu Shams is the Kilroy Realty Professor of Psychiatry, Vice Chair for Community Engagement, Outreach and Advocacy, and Deputy Vice Chair for Research at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital for the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences of the University of California, San Francisco. She is a child clinical and forensically trained psychologist who is also the director of the Juvenile Injustice Behavioral Health Research Lab based at Zuckerberg SF General Hospital. Her career has been devoted to clinical, systems, administrative, research and advocacy approaches to increase community-based access to behavioral health care for system-involved youth and families. As of 2015, these efforts extended into studying and implementing how technology may be leveraged to promote equitable access to behavioral health care for minoritized youth and families. Prior to joining UCSF, Marina was faculty at Brown University, where she started Rhode Island's first family court mental health clinic that, over 15 years later, continues to provide rapid mental health assessments and linkage to community-based care for court-involved youth. We're excited for her to lead today's discussion on tequity and behavioral health services. So without further ado, Dr. Tulu Shams. Dr. May, congratulations, by the way. And um, thank you so much for that generous introduction. I'm so excited to be with you all uh, today. I'm going to um, go ahead and share my screen and um, really appreciate um, folks putting in the chat where they're from um, as well. Uh, that's exciting to see who's in the audience. Okay. So today I'm really excited to be with you uh, to talk about our experiences um, in co-designing the Foster Space app. And um, I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest to report uh, related to this talk. Before I start here, um, I just want to, oh, I apologize, did that stop sharing? But I'm sorry. Okay, this is always um, the best part of doing research to leverage technology <laughs> when the tech, uh, when, when I don't know how to use the tech. So this is always what happens. Um, but before I start, I just really wanna be clear that none of this work can happen without all of these funders, community members, um, and the partnering youth, young adults, families. I'm gonna talk really in depth actually about our co-design group, but we couldn't have done any of this without all of these partners. And I also want to um, acknowledge the National Institute on Drug Abuse for um, funding this work as well. So at our lab um, at UCSF, our mission is to leverage technology for good to expand behavioral health care access for systems impacted youth. And here are some uh, pictures of our team um, out actually enjoying themselves uh, for a retreat. So I'll just give a brief overview of what we're going to get into. I'm actually going to start by sharing with you what Foster Space is, the actual behavioral health intervention that is through the technology. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about why did we create Foster Space and then really go into Foster Space lessons learned. And through that, I'll be talking about participatory co-design um, approaches. 
so let's talk definitions a little bit. There's nothing um, more frustrating than when you're in a talk and folks are using words or acronyms that um, really you're going, what, what does that mean? All the way through the talk. So when I'm referring to system impacted youth, I'm really talking about adolescents and young adults through age 26, that's who served through our app, who've had some type of contact with juvenile legal and or child welfare systems. They could be duly involved. Um, you might hear me refer to in-home placement versus out-of-home placement, where in-home is family, is court involved through dependency courts, but the youth remains in the home. And we're trying to prevent out-of-home placement, which is when the youth is court involved through dependency courts and they're placed out of the home. Just FYI, 75% of San Francisco youth are actually placed out of county. Um, so that's a high number. And kinship care, we are referring to youth who are court involved through dependency courts, but resource foster care is provided by the relative. I'm going to use the term behavioral health a lot. I just really want to be clear. People may already know this, but I'm talking about mental health and substance use. And the two terms today that might be even newer are co-design. And that's a participatory approach to designing solutions in which intended users from target communities actively participate in designing technologies for their community. And this definition was actually also informed by our Foster Space Advisory Board members. Now, Techwity is definitely a newer term, um, and we will talk about that a little bit more, but we're referring to the strategic development and deployment of technology to promote health equity. And we're going to talk about how our team uh, layers on frameworks of social justice and anti-racism in clinical work and research to achieve Techwity. So what is Foster Space? I'm going to show you a, a demo that we have where we that we show our partners so you can learn more about what foster space is. Welcome to foster space, an app tailored to your mental health and wellness needs. Foster space was co-designed in collaboration with our foster space advisory board. The fab is made up of Bay Area foster youth who are passionate about empowering their community by making it easier to find and access the resources they need to flourish. With Foster Space, you can take charge of your mental wellness, keep track of your mood with the Foster Space Daily Mood Tracker, take an emotional wellness assessment so your clinical care team can provide support based on your needs, or check out our catalog of wellness resources carefully selected by our Foster Space peer co-designers and UCSF care team. Foster Space is here for you. Just reach out to us via the Foster Space chat function, and a member of our team will be available to answer your questions. Find helpful resources in your community. If local resources are what you're looking for, Foster Space has you covered. Search county specific resources by service need. Personalize your list further by using the like function. And as always, you can reach out to one of our navigators for questions about available resources. Organize and set personal goals. As a foster space user, you can create missions to help you achieve your personal goals. Feeling stuck? Reach out to the foster space care team for your additional support creating missions. Registering for the app is easy and we have your back if you have any questions. Register today at fosterspace.com and you can learn more at this extension here. And contact us with any questions at fosterspace at ucsf.edu. Okay, so those voices that you heard were actually our Foster Space Advisory Board. And let me tell you, there were a lot of discussions about the lo-fi, the music, the sound. So we'll talk about that more. They, they decided on it all. I just want to go through the different functions that you heard about that are part of the app. And these functions were actually developed with our Foster Space Advisory Board, who you're going to see in a couple minutes on the next slide. But there's a peer support function, which is part of the FAB chat and Foster Space Advisory Board, who are made up of those foster youth with living experience, provide act, uh, users with access to resources and offer ongoing peer support and guidance through the app. We have navigation services. So that's a live navigator. You might have seen like, hi, I'm Astrid, the navigator. And that's 
um, a live navigator to be able to support young people navigating the complex systems and resources to meet their needs. We have direct clinical services through the app, and I'll talk a little bit more that, about that with a case example. Um, those are with licensed clinicians uh, who are providing direct evidence-based care to young people who would like it through the app and using Zoom, HIPAA compliant Zoom. There's a curated resource directory. Right now, the app is only in California across 58 counties. Um, each county has different level of resources for uh, foster youth that we include in there, depending on what county they're from. We include assessments and emotional wellness questionnaire. The FAB uh, curated that emotional wellness questionnaire and took an evidence-based instrument and made some suggestions about how to think about wording of these assessments so that they were destigmatizing and more foster youth friendly. Um, we have a mood tracker that you saw that empowers kind of daily mood tracking and self-monitoring. Missions are used in the app to support goal organization. So missions can be pushed out by the navigator or the clinicians to the users, depending on what their goals are, or young people can create their own missions as reminders for what they want to be achieving. And then we have an in-app chat function that allows them to communicate with members of their care team, which include the clinicians, the navigator, and the foster space advisory board. So here are, here's our original, our OG uh, co-design group, um, Ashley, Dylan, JJ, and Tilia. And um, I'm just gonna play one testimonial from JJ. Later on, we'll have a chance, hopefully, to let you choose if you'd like to hear more and which ones. But um, I'm gonna let you listen to JJ's experience and why JJ chose to join us in this co-design process. Um, can you see that developing? Maybe the new screen share. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Now you should be able to see it. Perfect. I've been in the foster system since I was about six years old. And um, so, I mean, fortunately, you know, I wasn't alone. I had my three other siblings with me, you know, obviously there's other people who aren't fortunate to have siblings, you know, or have someone, a best friend to really just be there through that hard times um, in their lives. Um, but, you know, with this app, you know, the goal is to provide that, you know, whether it's a fellow foster youth or a clinician um, or a navigator, you know, just someone to share their life with in a way and kind of find purpose and meaning in that. And so one thing that I really want to emphasize through this app is just that your trauma does not define you, you know, um, life is hard, but there are so many ways to make life a little bit easier. And with this app, you know, it's definitely made my life a little bit easier just to know that there are others in my community who have been through similar, you know, events and, you know, have struggled with mental health. Um, and, you know, I really just want to make a community out of this and let other foster youth know that they're not alone in this and that they have a voice. And yeah, it's been great. Okay. So um, Ashley, Dylan, JJ, and Tilly, we actually, so a, a large part of this co-design process for us is around workforce development pipeline and exposure as well. So I want to be really clear that all of our foster space advisory board members are paid for their time and have been. When I talk about the process, we that is critical. Um, here are the phases of our process. So this was um, an 18 month process, pretty much 12 to 18 months. The first year we spent weekly in 90 minute to two hour sessions with our co-design team and several of our academic co-designers, um, faculty and staff, clinical research coordinators and our fab and our chorus technology partners um, who approach technology in terms of a participatory co-design approach, which I'll talk about a little bit. But I wanted to show you the phases that we went through because to give you a sense of kind of what's required here, um, so we started with our design phase and we determined the app design. Now, when I say we, we really relied on our fab to deter all of the space theme that you see, all of the different words and um, design aspects. You saw them in their um, little space suits and everything was all driven by the fab. 
it was a challenge to figure out what was something that was developmentally appropriate to going from age 13 to 26, for example, for the users. Um, the development phase, we created the app and the content, developed an initial version of the Foster Space app. The fab created the psychoeducation content and the care team. So the clinicians developed the triage um, procedures, triage and assessment procedures. The launch was when we disseminated the app to the target population. And we did user recruitment through distributing flyers, attending community events, hosting workshops. So the fab leads all of the informational meeting partnerships. They have been going to all of the schools. They've been going to all of the partners to talk about foster space. Then um, we did some testing and evaluation um, really to ensure that the app was effective, to work out the bugs with the app, to make sure um, that we were collecting feedback and doing iterative refinement. So we were collecting feedback from users, which is the fifth phase. Um, and we developed the fab chat and we expanded the fab to this adulting 101 series, which you'll see a little bit about. So there were ways in which we took the user feedback and they said, these pieces are missing. And we started to add some of them in. So we use co-design as the method and we integrate social justice and anti-racism frameworks to achieve tech equity. So I want to go back to this for a minute. Because this, um, this Clark et al. in 2021 wrote a an, an really, really amazing paper about this, integrating social justice and anti-racism frameworks to achieve tech equity. Um, and you have the reference in the slides. But really, if you know about... Um, youth participatory action research approaches. This is very similar, but we're applying it to technology and developing interventions through technology. And so one, you wanna invest in people and communities. You need to be trustworthy. You have to collect data that are relevant to diverse communities and you have to keep it secure. Lots of conversations between us and the FAB on this. Um, using artificial intelligence and analytics to promote health equity, having that at the forefront. Technology is not a panacea. Ruha Benjamin has written extensively on this and how AI and other analytics have been used to surveil our most minoritized communities. So we have to really keep this at the forefront. There's a lot of work and research needed to be done in this area, particularly as we're talking about using technology for good for behavioral health care access. What are we risking as well? Um, purchasers of techs or end users must also drive the change. This is at the forefront. They need to be in on the ground floor. We have to give youth voice at the ground floor to design, not come in and bring something in and say, how now do we work this out for young people? It is a transformational experience to work with young people in this way to see what comes out of it. Develop innovative partnerships that engage diverse communities. And our young people really know how to do this very, very well. So why did we create Foster Space? Okay, it's poll time. Um, so I'm going to ask you now to engage to say, what percent of foster youth have unaddressed mental health needs relative to what percent of the general youth population? What do we think? Okay, this is a savvy audience. We're still getting participant responses. <clears throat> okay, so by a slim margin, everyone got the right, the, the majority got the right response. 80%, oh, we're still getting some in. 80% of foster youth have unaddressed mental health needs relative to 22% of the general population. That's staggering difference. Okay, so there are over 391,000 children in youth and foster care with the largest unmet need being behavioral health care. And then this was the statistic that I just, you just did the poll on. All right, another poll, keeping you on your toes here. Youth in foster care are nearly X times more likely than youth never removed from their home to misuse substances.
Okay. All right, so it's poll slowing down. So actually, the answer to this is five times more likely. Uh, many of you said 10 times more likely, which suggests we all know that um, this is a very high risk factor for misusing substances, and we want to try to prevent removal from the home. All right, last one for now. Um, over blank percent of youth in contact with the child welfare system, ages 11 to 14 years, so early adolescents, have clinically significant mental health needs, yet only X percent utilize mental health services. Okay. Oh, we have a tie. <laughs> so the correct answer is over 66% of youth in contact with the child welfare system ages 11 to 14 years have clinically significant mental health needs, yet only 26% utilize mental health services. Two thirds are in need and only a quarter are actually utilizing. We have to transform access in this space. Great, thanks for um, engaging on that. So we see ecology as the driver of behavioral health need, youth behavioral health need. We conceptualize this in context of a youth being having multiple circles, concentric circles around them that are influencing and driving their behavior. And so when we conceptualize like that, we broadly define mental and behavioral health. We in our lab don't conceptualize mental and behavioral health just as clinical need. We see housing as mental health. We view employment as mental health. And so here, what we have on this screen is these are all the different resources that we provide to young people who use the app. So this is resource needs requested by all 40 users upon first login to the app. And what you can see here is the majority are requesting resources around emotional wellness. And perhaps that's not surprising since it is um, described as an emotional wellness app. But what is what is you know, here that you can really see is that housing, school, employment, healthcare, transportation, those are all critical resource needs for these young people. And unless we're addressing that, then we're really not able to fully target the emotional wellness. That's how we conceptualize this. And that's how the app was built. And so social determinants of health driving um, emotional well-being and mental health is really a core component of this. And our Foster Space Advisory Board guided all of that. So I want to give you a case example. All names have been changed to protect the youth of a young person named Amari who has used the app. He's eight, they're 18 years old, highly motivated, high achieving client, former foster youth, has been involved with therapeutic services for at least six years after the death of both parents. And I don't know if I said this explicitly, but our app is for those who are current and former foster youth. Um, so I wanna make that really clear. Um, so they, uh, Amari reported consistent, persistent feelings of being on edge and not belonging. History of frequent relocations, witness to parental substance use, parental death, emotional trauma, and foster care. And here's what Amari said about the app. I really liked how there were no barriers using telehealth services. So this is using the clinical services. There was no judgment and it was accessible, more real. With other counseling and therapy apps, it didn't feel real. And then um, the client exhibited several strengths and reported from using the app and getting the services, increased mindful awareness, improvements in their ability to express themselves, and an increased ability to tolerate physical and emotional discomfort after they had actually 15 sessions. So they were very engaged. And um, the sessions, we use, like I said, an evidence-based approach. 
that is part of the unified protocol for transdiagnostic treatment of emotional disorders. And it's very flexible and can be tailored. So it's, you know, using evidence-based strategies for emotion identification, mindful emotional awareness training, cognitive flexibility training, um, exposing to strong emotions, so a lot of emotion regulation strategies. And what you can see down here at the bottom is Amari's progress over treatment that the um, positive emotions that we assessed through the anxiety scale or the positive emotion scale, um, and we also use the anxiety scale, the OASIS to measure, assesses the frequency intensity of a client's symptoms and behaviors. And what you can see here for Amari is that the red line is the positive emotions and you see their report of positive emotions going up and you see their report of anxiety symptoms going down. That's what we wanna see. And we wanna see that they were able to access the care quickly and rapidly. So what are users saying about foster space services? They're saying this was some of the feedback that we got from our evaluation. I decided to start using foster space when someone reached out to me and I realized it was a real person and not a robot, which made it seem safe. I needed help identifying emotional wellness resources available based on my insurance. The emotional wellness quiz, which again, like I mentioned, was is the diagnostic, um, the DSM-5 screening assessment, level one and level two. And our foster youth re renamed it as the emotional wellness quiz, which was critical to engaging young people to fill out the items. This person said put into the, that quiz, put into perspective how things were going. I sometimes lie to myself about my condition. And so I think it made me realize that things were affecting me more than I actually thought. After I took the survey, I started making changes. I was already in therapy, but I talked to the navigator about getting a new therapist. So here you see the power of navigation as someone, as a resource to help them figure out what's really the best fit for them. It's a lot to navigate. I like quick replies from immediate staff. It was calming to have someone immediately available. I enjoyed having a real person to talk to and it was so fast. So this is why this kind of hybrid app situation is really key, that it's not all automated, that it's not all chatbot. And that was actually something that our co-design process really illuminated. Okay. I want to just say before we go to choose your own adventure, I want to just share a couple of things about the co-design process. We have a manuscript that's under review, which is why I couldn't share it. It's a revise and resubmit. We're very excited about it. It was led by one of our co-designers, Tilia, and um, one of our clinical research coordinators, E.P. Azamora, who did a fantastic job of doing a duo ethnography process, which is when you're taking reflections from those engaged in a process, and then you're actually qualitatively analyzing those reflections to come up with themes. And Tilia, as part of our fab and EFI, and then the rest of our fab, wanted to do a duo ethnography of their reflections of the co-design process. And as part of that, um, they came up with themes related to their co-design process. And one of those was about power and control. And they talk very explicitly about the dynamics of power and control being in a space where there's hierarchy with academic faculty and researchers and staff and how they navigated that process and really what the space kind of needs to look like to be able to achieve this tequity and this ultimate co-design process. And so, when they they talk about also how when control was explicitly like and openly given to them by those who are typically seen right as those in power, that that was incredibly empowering for them and that they actually were able to build like community and safe space around it for themselves and identify that actually they were able to rely on each other to build a sense of community. So you heard JJ talk about this a bit. Um, one of the unintended beautiful effects that we had, and this is something I'd actually like to research more about, is what happens when you engage in this process and those who are the co-designers are actually benefiting from a mental health perspective, that that was an intervention in and of itself. So that's just one example. And I'm happy to share with YJI the um, reference for the paper when it comes out so you could distribute to your um, 
your attendees. And so I will just also say that our goal is to actually hire young people into the pipeline of um, the mental health workforce. And so now Tilia is a full-time clinical research coordinator with us, also part of the FAB. Dylan is also um, working closely with us um, in a policy space as we have a foster space challenge um, with uh, to build resilience in young people uh, who have lived experience in the foster care system. And um, so we're really, really excited about that. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop there and um, see if we can have time to do a choose your own adventure poll. Okay, where we are going to allow you to choose, would you like to listen to another testimonial from one of the FAB members? Would you like to see a coping skills video or some part of it that's actually incorporated into the app but is led by a FAB member? or one of the Adulting 101 videos that were added after we got feedback from users. And it involves cooking with JJ. Okay, looks like we're, oh. Still getting response. Looks like fab coping skills is coming in strong. I think we'll, <laughs> I don't think the others are going to catch up. Okay, great. All right. So let me get to that. That's perfect because it was the next slide. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay. So we're not going to do another poll around um, the choosing. I'm just going to go ahead and give you exposure to um, another tab member and I have to do a new share one second. Hmm. It's not showing up for some reason. Let me see. Can you see this? Yes. Perfect. Okay. And um, we may not play this whole video, but we'll get started. Hello, my name is Dylan Myers. I'm a former foster youth and a member of the Foster Space Advisory Board. With how fast paced and demanding modern society is, it is very easy to get caught up in our emotions and feel like we are the only ones feeling this way. I'm here to tell you that it is perfectly normal to feel this way and that you are not alone. I wanna share with you my favorite grounding exercise that I use whenever I feel this way. The exercise we are going to practice in a few moments is called Five Senses Grounding. This mindfulness exercise helps ground us in the present and focus a distressed or anxious mind. Before we begin, it is important that you feel safe in your surroundings. As we go along, feel free to pause this video between each activity. Together, Let's start by taking a deep breath. This will help slow us down a bit. Focusing on the breath, inhale and exhale. There is no right or wrong way. Okay, I'm gonna stop us. Oh, oh no, sorry for one sec, because I'm thinking maybe I could just show you Tilia a little bit so you can see um, a difference just for a minute or so. Um, and um, I just want to also emphasize they did this all on their own, like literally did it on their own. They got, they asked us for some feedback on kind of like what skill, right, that they, you know, what skills they should focus on. Um, but let me just, um, I'd love to just show you just a little tidbit from Tilia too. Hello, my name is Tilia, and I'm a part of the Foster Space Advisory Board. In this video, I'm going to go through square breathing, which can be helpful when trying to decompress from strong emotions or body sensations. It's okay to feel overwhelmed in your current situation, and I invite you to join me in this exercise to calm our minds and bodies down. 
Before we begin, please make sure you feel safe in your surroundings. Feel free to pause and move if you need to. And just to go a little more into square breathing, it's a technique that helps us focus our breathing patterns and reduce stress in the body. In this video, we will be using this square shape to do the exercise. And as we move through the exercise together, we will be breathing in from corner to corner, holding our breath from corner to corner, breathing out from corner to corner, and then holding our breath again from corner to corner. We'll repeat this exercise once more, but feel free to rewind and do it as many times as needed. Let's begin in two, three. So uh, you can see how they really did Tilia, they did such an amazing job with coordinating the graphics even. I mean, it's just really, um, this is what can happen when you give young people the floor. And you have links um, moving forward if you'd like to see the Adulting 101 with JJ or the testimonial from Ashley, Tilia, or Dylan. I'll end by just going over some lessons learned. Um, if you build it, they may not come. Many users explored our app, but did not register to use. And so we're looking into that to see how we might think about engaging users moving forward. One of the biggest lessons learned as part of if you build it, they may not come, is that we really see this as a tool to be adjunctive support to those already serving foster youth. We have a National Institute on Drug Abuse grant pending to actually look at uptake and utilization of the Foster Space app with court-appointed special advocates in California who are already serving foster youth, but don't have access to mental health resources or knowledge. Um, and then evaluating outcomes. This has been a big challenge. We are researchers as well as clinicians and integration of research has created barriers to brevity and accessibility. The consent form that our institutional review board requires us to use is very lengthy. And we're very worried about that serving as a barrier. Right now, the data that you saw today and we have more of it is all QIQA um, and we're engaging in the more detailed research assessment process. Um, with a more detailed research consent. Ethical considerations. We've talked about this a bit. Technology is not a panacea. We have to protect against risk while providing care. And this is a call out there for more research around the ethics of doing this techquity work. And we speak different languages with our tech developers. Um, working with a third-party developer has been an immense learning curve for all of us and for them as well, even though they, they actually coined the participatory technology co-design approach, um, we discovered along the way. And so there's a big learning curve, I would say, for those who aren't in the technology space. And um, what's next is the challenge that I just mentioned. We're engaged in a federal challenge to promote resilience among foster youth using the Foster Space app. And then I just already mentioned that our grant is pending to evaluate use within court-appointed special advocate programs. Questions? Um, you'll have this resource. And thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going, okay, great. Uh, this has been awesome, and we are really excited for that paper to come out. So when you do get that, please do share that with us, and we're happy to distribute that to our attendees today. Um, so hopping right into questions, uh, you've, you've answered this a little bit, but what did the co-design process look like for this project from inception all the way to evaluation? Yeah, great question. So it looked like those weekly meetings for 90 minutes to two hours with our four original uh, FAB members and our clinical staff and academic faculty. So a big group, six to nine people at any given time, not including the tech developers. We did it by Zoom because we were still actually in the height of COVID. And um, then the in between the meetings, there would be goals. We'd come back and forth. So 
And then the group, um, with the exception of Ashley, who took um, more of a full-time job after the 18-month process, they we continued to fund the fab to actually look at the data with us that were coming through. And I mentioned QIQA, it's um, quality improvement and quality assurance data, um, as we were just piloting the app. So we didn't launch a full-scale research trial is what I was just trying to say with this app yet. That's coming. But we really wanted to figure out how we were doing with our users initially before launching into full research. So the fab was also involved in looking at those qualitative data, everything you've seen, the fab has been involved in and they continue um, to inform the next stage of the work. That's an amazing model. I'm and we've expanded the fab too, I just wanna say. So we just hired several new members, sorry. No, that's great. Uh, it kind of leads into this other question that we have. Um, so this is currently in San Francisco or is it elsewhere yet? Um, so this is California statewide California. available, but unfortunately not yet outside of California. We'd love to do it nationally, but you can imagine from a resource uh, directory perspective, we'd have to partner with a county or a state to actually build it for that county state. Yeah. And so with that question, how do you think this would scale up? What are some of the concerns or challenges that you would anticipate in scaling it up? Yeah, so one of the um, challenges I think would be around the clinical services. So um, as you know, we have licensure regulations cross state that preclude us from, I, you know, psychology is trying to transform that, um, but we're not there yet. So it would have to, it requires an infrastructure within another county, state jurisdiction to actually provide those services. That's, I think that's the biggest piece. I think the resources, the navigator, the fab chat, all of that can be brought to scale pretty easily provided there's the resources to, because again, it's not all automated. Right. And you're talking about the resources. We were curious, what are some of the supports that you provide to the young people while building out the resource? And was there anything that you didn't anticipate needing to provide when you were building it and in the sustainability space that you're in now? Mm, so you're asking about support for the co-designers or the users or both? Um, primarily for the co-designers yeah. and the continued um, work that they're needing to do as the navigators, not the navigators, but as the yeah. staff chat. Yeah. Okay. So I will just say that one of the things when we started this with this technology company, who's amazing, of course, but um, they didn't yet have like an SMS text messaging capability. So all of the fab chat and the missions and everything were going through the app, but they were also going through email for notifications. And, and young people were like, I'm not seeing my email. So we are in the process now that they, that company has, so this is like where you navigate navigate, but this is where you balance, like what a platform may have at a certain time, how it evolves. So now we're actually getting the text messaging built in. So all notifications will go through text messaging. And we actually think that's really going to enhance the user engagement and experience. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, and I can imagine all of the, if somebody has a phone number and they change the phone number, they have an email and they change the email, I can imagine yeah. how that would cause things to be difficult. That's that's right. And that's why the having the human centered component within the app is so key because we can have like supervision with the fab and the clinicians and say, okay, who have we lost to engagement? How are we going to re-engage them? Right. So that it's just not all of this automation. Um, I think that's really, really key with the tailoring and the engagement for these young people. Do you I'm going rogue here. Do users um, have the same navigator that they come back to time and time again, or is it a, a yeah. different, like, is that's it the goal. Place? Yeah, oh. that's the goal. The fab chat, they have like office hours right now. So they, depending on when they reach out to the fab chat, they could have a different fab member, but no, the navigator, it, the idea is that they're stable and assigned. Okay. Um, back into this like scalability type questions. For organizations that for one reason or another can't design or implement the use of an app, what advice do you have for the co-design process more generally in terms of designing programs or services that may not be able to be app-based, but yeah. general process? 
fantastic question. I think um, if you are getting some sort of resources or you have an idea for a service, I think the first thing to do is to actually go to a youth serving organization before you even develop anything. And you ask if you can have a meeting, a town hall, bring food, um, if you're able to, it's not remotely. There are other ways to kind of create community online too, which we could talk about, but, um, and actually build from there the idea. Seed it with the young people. It's, it is just, it really is transformational what can come about when you start there versus coming in already with an idea. And that's what I would, I would say, sit around the table, whether it's the virtual table or not. Young people want to be heard. They, you know, adults are known for not listening to young people, right? Transform that in your space, transform that in your being and amazing things can happen. It was really interesting how you talked about earlier that being part of this type of process was itself beneficial. And so I would love if you're doing more research about that, if you could share that with us. That was fascinating. Yeah, I, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think you'll see some of that in the um, dual ethnography paper. Um, yeah. So switching gears to some questions about the interactivity with the app. Do users have to verify their foster status before accessing the app and its features? And how does that verification process, if it exists, happen? Great question. So we do have like a, some screening questions that we ask them, but they're all self-report. So we don't go to try to verify through collateral information. Um, we're really taking young people at their word. And we've not actually run, I will say with some of our other interventions, we've run into scamming big time. Um, we have not run into that with foster space, which I think is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the um, engagement is more automated for some of our other research studies um, in this space, like of trying to engage with um, sending text messaging to engage with substance use treatment for young people on probation, for example. We've had a lot of scammers that way when we started to um, send the opportunity out through like Instagram and there are gift cards attached to completing, right? So some of that, but no, we haven't run into it with foster space. And I think part of it is because we have the human verification, uh, ultimately like the navigator will reach out or the clinician will reach out depending on what the young person is asking for. The majority are asking for resources initially. And this was actually a big choice point that the co-design and the fab thought about because we, um, initially created too many layers to get to what they wanted within the app. So, you know, we have resources, we have a navigator and we have clinical services and we have the fab chat. And initially it was like, okay, we'll fill out the emotional wellness questionnaire and tell us what resource domains, you know, you're in need of. And then you can get to a navigator or then you can get to clinical services. We took that all out. We said, come in, use the app for whatever you need. You could just use it for resources. You could just use it for a navigator. You could just get straight clinical services. You don't have to do anything other than the initial like kind of intake assessment for the clinical services to develop the treatment plan. Okay, so it became a little less like railroad. Like yep. you have to go this one path and more free flowing. Yeah, and that was really important, that flexibility. Yeah, and that kind of relates to this next thing. Um, so the app has missions and it seems like there's other like gamification qualities to it. So does this help with engaging the youth who use it? And with that, that's the youth, what does this provide to the service providers and what yeah. does it provide to the researchers and evaluators if you can speak to the different stakeholders? Yeah, okay. So um, for the young people, I'll be really honest. I think the missions are going to be much more engaging and useful when we have the text messaging notification because what was happening was that the missions, if there was a mission launch, let's say by the navigator clinician, it was going to the email for notification and they were just missing it. So that's one of the things that we noticed. Um, it's very helpful for the service providers because they're tracking kind of goal attainment, goal interest, and kind of what is when a mission is completed, it, you know, it's an opportunity for positive reinforcement. Um, and then 
um, what was the other group you asked about? The service providers, the youth? So researchers are evaluating. Oh, research evaluators. So we need to do a deeper dive into that. I think I would like to wait until we have the text messaging notification because our whole team has just really noted that. That's been a big barrier. Um, and we had a couple of like sub questions about that, about uh, for, for youth who are potentially like uh, neurodiverse and how does that work with engaging um, in these types of game type systems or not game that is, That's a really, really, really important question. I'm so glad someone asked that. And um, we need to explore that in the app. Yeah, we really do. We need to... Um, look at that and interestingly enough that the that that has not come up with the fab or at least directly so thank you for that question i'm going to take that back to the team great happy to be generative and helpful here yeah that's fantastic um so we had a question about the reports or measures that the app produces for example is it some, like amari's journey that was presented on the slides is that something that comes out of the app or is that something that still needs like to be built up afterwards? Um, oh, this is such a great question because now you're giving me ideas about, no, so we, so what happens is the clinician, it's derived clinically. So the clinician comes back to the young person as part of the intervention and talks about their assessment results and how that's informed, as you would do in standard kind of clinical care. Um, they do get, uh, reporting back right away from their emotional wellness quiz. So they get their results. And um, this again was informed by the fab. It was decided to be uh, displayed back to them in that kind of gamification way of like your rocket fuel is high on this, your space rocket fuel is lower on this um, to kind of guide them in terms of areas in which they may want some type of intervention or supports around. So that does immediately get back to them. That's really interesting. Um, okay, and so we've talked about a couple of different perspectives and you had a lot of stakeholders around the table throughout this entire process. So they, I'm sure, all brought various strong views on the app's development. How did you handle conflicting opinions and provide quality assurance to make sure that your product was as high quality as you could at the end of the day? Yeah. I'm just going back to the co-design process to think about because again, I think this is well described probably like throughout this paper that's under revision, but um, something happens in that space if it's really um, if it's really a co-design space in which there is a communication, there's like a felt safety in which you can talk about those disagreements. I, I'm really trying to remember like how we came to consensus on things. It's interesting to me that I can't fully remember. I mean, our perspective was that we gave the young people the the fab first right of refusal on anything. And if it was something that wasn't actually feasible to do, like within the technology platform, the technology developers who, again, had done other projects in this co-design space, they spent a lot of time with us, um, would, would let the fab know, well, that's a, you know, that's a really great idea. Maybe for the next iteration, we could think about doing that if we expand our platform in some way. Um, so, and then sometimes there were side conversations with the fab if they didn't feel comfortable bringing up something that they felt like wasn't going to work well, there would be um, internal conversations between us and our team, or maybe they wanted to talk just one-to-one. -one. That's still happening sometimes because um, there's a level of vulnerability there, I think, in terms of uh, disagreement and the power and the control hierarchy, Right. That's there, who's making the final decisions. As much as we we work to give that to the young people, it's still there. You have to name it in the space. That's another way to kind of um, open the door for the conversation. So it sounds like themes of transparency and ensuring that safety and yeah. technology. Yeah, and that's, a, um, that's an ongoing process. It's not finite. And uh, our team takes a perspective that one's never like reaches competency in that space as an academic and working with the community. Okay. 
Um, this next one is also about the research process. So how, if you've been able to, are you able to measure impact? Uh, hmm. And is that piece also co-designed? Okay, great question. Um, so we actually, I, I would say at this point, we've only assessed um, feasibility, acceptability, and initial reach. And this uh, pending grant that is looking at very, it's a it's a large scale implementation science grant of foster space and looking at foster space impact on reducing substance use and improving mental health symptoms on the youth as well. That is where we're going to be able to start to measure impact. So we're looking at systems level variables actually related to um, reach and all of these other implementation science outcomes. Um, utilization, uptake, looking at the barriers and facilitators of that within CASA programs, for example, and then also looking at youth-driven outcomes that I mentioned. So that is to be to be continued. I hope to be able to come back to talk about some of those findings. Right, great. We would look forward to it. Um, and then this is the final question. Uh, there are more, so uh, thank you. It's been a, a really wonderful conversation. Uh, do you have any recommendations for an agency or a team who is interested in a similar project focused more on youth with justice system involvement as compared to foster? Yes, I do, because that is uh, those are the young people our team actually has been working with for years. And actually, we've we've entered more into the dually involved young people in foster care space more recently. Um, again, driven by our partnerships and with the young people. Um, so um, the technology piece, I think, would be to think about with the young people at what intercept in the um, juvenile legal space is most appropriate for co-design of an intervention like this as a start, right? So um, that would be, I think, the first step. I think there is a lot, lot of promise for diversion programs, for example, um, to think about working with community-based organizations. Again, go to those CBOs working with the young people who are involved in the juvenile legal system and are community-based, community-supervised, because the technology piece is definitely more challenging once we get into the detention realm, but re-entry, a critical, critical period as well. So I would say go to those CBOs, understand from the young people they're serving and see what they want to do, what would be most helpful to them. Excellent. Marina, thank you so much on behalf of the YJI and everyone in attendance today uh, for taking the time to share this important information with us. Before I shift into closing announcements, I want to hand it back to you for some final concluding thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I can't see everyone, but I feel like I'm in this space where everyone is very generative and really thinking about ways in which we bring youth voice forward in designing these interventions that are for them. I'm a clinically trained psychologist. I was trained in cognitive behavioral therapy. There's very much a way of doing things in graduate school and our programs. And I just want to bring forward the opportunity and the invitation to everyone to take risks and really think about centering youth voice from the start to build interventions that are really going to help support them and improve their emotional wellness, mental health, and reduce substance use um, into adulthood. Thank you so much. Um, so in a moment here, we're going to launch a poll question asking about how much our audience today agrees or disagrees with the statements, the webinar was informative and the webinar was engaging. Please answer these questions so we know how today's webinar went for you. While everyone is answering that question, I have a couple of announcements and items to put on everyone's radar. The next YGI Lunch and Learn webinar session will be held on March 12th at 12 p.m. Eastern with Dr. Margaret Robinson. Her presentation is titled Responding to Mental Health Needs of Two-Spirit People. The link to register should be in chat now. Immediately following this webinar, a survey should appear in the browser window that you used to join today's webinar. Please complete the survey as it allows you to provide further feedback and questions for us. This information is also used to improve future webinar sessions. 
the survey should take no longer than five minutes, and it's also in the chat now. Finally, if you've not already done so, feel free to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, X, formerly Twitter, and LinkedIn. The links to those accounts can be found on our website. Just a reminder that the views expressed here are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views of New York State Youth Justice Institute. In closing, I want to thank everyone for taking part of this session of the YGI's Lunch and Learn series. We hope that you gained something from this webinar and that you continue to think about what Dr. Timu Shams has presented today. We look forward to seeing you at future YJI events.